and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Rachel Rubel. Those suffering from the world's worst humanitarian crisis have been given a new glimmer of hope after a series of deals were reached to quell the fighting in Yemen. Representatives from the warring parties met in the Swedish town of Rimbo, where they hashed out agreements that will impose ceasefires and allow for the flow of humanitarian assistance. Arriving on the last day of the peace talks, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres announced several breakthroughs, including the withdrawal of forces from the port of Hudeda, the exchange of thousands of prisoners, and establishing a humanitarian corridor into Yemen's third largest city of Taiz. In total, 15,000 prisoners will be exchanged in a sign of goodwill as Houthi fighters and forces backed by the Saudi coalition are expected to begin a phased withdrawal from the crucial port. If the ceasefire holds, it will reopen a lifeline where 90% of the country's food imports and 75% of its humanitarian needs pass through. Although hopes were high as the warring parties met face to face, major sticking points remain, including the status of the main airport in the capital, Sana'a. Previous peace agreements have crumbled, prompting warnings that international support needs to be at the forefront to prevent a similar fate. And joining me now is Kaukab Al Dabani, who is a co founder of the Women for Yemen Network, and Hamid Al Shajni, who is a political analyst and is the founder and CEO of Global Gate Group, a consultancy service for natural resources. Thank you both for joining me today. Um, Dr. Hamid, I'll start with you. We've just had this uh, ceasefire agreement reached after this week long peace conference um, in Sweden. Do you think that the ceasefire will be successful this time around? And do you think the Yemeni people will be satisfied? Satisfied with it? Uh, to start with, I think it's a good step, like, no, in the uh, right direction, but it will depend on the intention. If the party intention is to have peace in Yemen and uh, get the Yemenis to enjoy life and go back to normal, then it will work as a first step and it will build on. But if the parties are trying to play a game, i.e., we do it today, in that we gain some time to get, get more weapons, more support, and so on and so forth then it is just like you no know, doing like a stitches to a kind of a, a pretty big uh, uh, tear shirt which is not going to help mm -hmm. uh, i was hoping that we're going to see in this type of talk a kind of an agenda for a pretty permanent peace and a kind of solution to the major problem which is having a civil, uh, a civil uh, uh, government mm -hmm. having a democratic process having a, an equal right uh, taking the militia out of the, the picture and like joining uh, the, the national army and recognize as a party, not as a militant or a force that like, can control the situation. At the time being, recognizing any of the parties, BL Houthi or those mm -hmm. like no militant in the south, is not going to help because by the end of the day, they don't represent the national uh, unity of the Yemen. They don't represent like the military. They are not. Uh, they are just uh, creating problems, and they are a uh, proxy war for the outside world, i.e., for like you know, as we know at the time being like you know, the Saudis and the Iranian, mm -hmm. and behind them are the United States and United United Kingdom and the rest of like you know, of the interest party that they are. They have a major interest of selling weapons to this region and mm -hmm. like you know, uh, create wars in here and there, which is like mm -hmm. you know, pretty sad. At the time being also, like you, know, you talk about now uh, the human issue in here, the, none okay. of the party are talking now about paying the Yemenis their own salary. Right. What, right. what I was expecting from the representative of the United mm -hmm. Nations to say, look, both parties, you have to pay the Yemenis their own salary right. to start with. There is nothing else m less than that. But at the time mm -hmm. being, they say, we're going to collect money and then we're going to... We right. might pay but this is but this is a, a good first step. It is a good step, okay. it, 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 depending on the intention. Mm -hmm. But at the, at the same time, it doesn't say very specifically. It should be a kind of like you no know, a government mm -hmm. that's ruled by uh, like by law, mm -hmm. it by democratic process, mm -hmm. by such. I just want to interrupt you real quick because I want to get to uh, Kaukab. I want to ask about uh, the port city of Hudeda, of course, where the ceasefire is uh, take, will take place. We've seen billions of dollars of aid that has been pledged throughout this conflict, but it's not um, reached and made a positive impact on the people of Yemen. Do you think with the ceasefire that the port city of Hudeda will now be open and be able to receive this aid? 
Um, I think it's not this simple. It's it's very hard. Actually, Yemen has like issue even before the war has started, and that's why it has reached this level. And people who know the Yemeni context, they know exactly why we reach this. We have a Prajaya state actually, and it was warning, it was warned before that Yemen will reach this step at one point later. So, and when the war has come, it has like destroyed the rest functioning um, governmental system that is supporting the basic needs of the people. So, um, so and, and also there is a misconception that the humanitarian aid is going to replace the commercial sector, and this is not the, 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 the what should done in the uh, what should be done in the in reality. The government has to come back, and also there should be more functioning uh, commercial and also livelihoods driven, economic driven, rather than hands out of aid. These are can, we can say like a fast emergency support, but they're not going to replace commercial sector and economic uh, growth of the country. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Senate has taken the lead in uh, condemning the disaster in Yemen, passing a measure that calls for an end to U.S. military support to the conflict. I want to play some bites uh, first from Senator Chris Murphy. The United States has said through the Senate that our support for the Saudi-led coalition is no longer open-ended that we expect our partners to be partners for peace, not just partners in war. All right, well, there has been increased um, scrutiny on Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, particularly the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman following the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, with Yemen in particular getting intense focus. Um, Dr. Hamid, do you believe that we'll see more pressure and similar measures from U.S. lawmakers to end military support in Yemen? I think uh, the, the, the American like no policy starts shifting to the right direction. Uh, we were very sad from the beginning that the support like, the allies because they, what they should have done, they should have support everybody like to have uh, a solution. But we find that one stage the United States were fighting with the Houthis in the ground to gain more territories like in Al-Bayda and other areas. At the same time, they were giving logistics to the Saudis and selling weapons and so on and so forth. They shouldn't ha if there was like a kind of a, a kind of a, a, a reality or a kind of a, a, a truth in uh, supporting the Yemeni, they shouldn't have like no support the Houthi in the first place to invade all Yemens, and they are not. They shouldn't support like the allies of bombing like the civilians everywhere. But the problem is money here play a very very like no uh, uh, dirty game. I.e., selling weapons all the time to the region is the major thing, and Trump hasn't been like no secretive about it. He said it many times: it's money, it's creating jobs. We need this money, we need this contract. So, it, when it comes to human rights and the, like no uh, uh, civilians, it comes as a minority issue. Uh, if there had been like no a kind of like no sincerity about this issue, it could have been solved from the beginning. Because by the end of the day. Why do you support like, you know, a militant to take mm -hmm. over a country to start with? That's a, a pretty sad thing. But we're hoping that the Americans start understanding. We need also the same pressure to be applied to Iran, because mm -hmm. Iran is not like, you know, an unguilty party, uh, party in this conflict. Like, you know, uh, Mohammed bin Salman is a guilty like, you know, in, in, in like, you know, doing a lot of uh, 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 critical issues in a very unmature way. But the Iranian at the same side, like pushing the Houthi to do their own game, okay. i.e. they are pushing the problem out of Iran into Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, mm -hmm. and other uh, countries, okay. which they suffer, why the Iranians are not suffering whatsoever from this conflict, and Iraq as well. Mm -hmm. Now, Cobb, I want to talk about what's been lacking throughout these peace talks. There was a photo that circulated online that showed there was just one woman in the room during the negotiations. Why is it so crucial crucial that women be a part of this? Um, <clears throat> first, we were sad to see like the last picture of people shaking hand and the photos of the delegates, and only no women is there. And it's a setback for all the feminist work we Yemeni women have been doing even before 2011. So um, it's very important to have women in any peace talks. It has been proved that 20% increase of lasting peace um, for two years, 35% increase for 15 years to have a lasting peace if women are included. So, um, and to be honest, and I'm sure many of my um, women colleagues will agree with me that 
a huge part of the success of the current first step of these talks is because of the efforts of the women who work behind the scene. They have been pushing some crucial issues. They have been trying to connect the um, parties of the conflict. And also, they have been trying their best to facilitate uh, the talks. And they have been trying to voice their concerns. So, and also, there are many issues they have over and over talk about it in UN um, Security Council. They have been talking in uh, meetings, lobbying for it. So it's very sad that at, at this point, when women on the ground, they're taking the full responsibility domestically, financially, they're taking the responsibility of the impact of the war because they will even take responsibility for children and men. And they are fully trusted on the ground. But when it comes to these negotiations, women are absent. Women are often overlooked when it comes to war and also children. I think I read that one child every 10 minutes yep. dies in Yemen. And 10 people, they don't know what, it, what, what is the, how to obtain the next meal. And um, um, there is, um, people are now heavily dependent on the, on the um, humanitarian aid. And you are seeing all the UN reports that Yemen now is over the edge yeah. to reach famine. So it is very catastrophic. There has to be done, there has to be done, and it has to be a Yemeni also to have a solution, and women have to be included as well in this. Mm -hmm. All right, Kaukaba al Dabani and Dr. Hamida al Shajni, thank you both for joining me today. It is one of the longest running conflicts in the world, but has often been overlooked by the global community. Stretching back to the days of India's partition more than seven decades ago, the people of Kashmir have been left in an uneasy limbo, stuck between two nuclear neighbors pitted against each other. And this year has been one of the deadliest in decades for the Kashmiris on the Indian side of a hotly contested border, as Omer Kablan explains. 20-month-old Heba was in her mother's arms when clouds of tear gas meant to disperse protesters on the streets entered their home. They tried to flee outside, but were met with pallets fired from Indian police. As soon as I tried to open the metal wire mesh door to get out, a soldier outside fired pellets at us. Instinctively, I covered Hiva's eyes with my hand, but pellets broke through the net and one lodged in her right eye. The tragedy surrounding Hiva Jeanne isn't out of the ordinary. Since 2010, Indian forces in Kashmir have used pallets fired from shotguns to quell protesters. Although touted as being non-lethal, the pallets have left hundreds blind and many dead. It has been described as the dead eye epidemic, the first mass blinding in modern history. While Heba may have become the youngest victim of the recent violence, those pushed to pick up arms aren't much older. Mudasir Rashid and Sakib Bilal were friends. In August, both went missing before photos of them heavily armed went viral. Just three months later, they were killed in fighting with Indian forces. Sakib was 17 and Mudasir was only 14, making him the youngest rebel killed in the three decade old armed uprising. This year alone, more than 500 people, including unarmed civilians, have been killed, making it the deadliest year in a decade. Landlocked between nuclear rivals India and Pakistan, Kashmir is one of the oldest political disputes in the world. Since 1947, the two countries have fought three wars to wrest control of the entire territory, which they currently administer in parts, making it the world's most militarized zone. Since 1989, the Indian state's military crackdown on an uprising has led to widespread human rights abuses. According to reports, more than 70,000 Kashmiris have been killed, and one out of four Kashmiris have been tortured, with thousands being subjected to what has been called forced disappearances. Hundreds of Indian soldiers have also been accused of sexual violence against women. But India has insisted that it is fighting a deadly insurgency and that the rebels have been armed and trained by Pakistan. The country's military leadership say their heavy-handed tactics will continue, despite widespread criticism. Pakistan's new Prime Minister Imran Khan has pushed for a dialogue with India to resolve the decades-old dispute. But India has ruled out the possibility of a resumption of talks unless Pakistan stops what India calls cross-border terror activities. But unless and until Pakistan stops terrorist activities in India, 
There'll be no dialogue. And as doctors struggle to save Heba's eyesight, only time will tell if she grows up to see a lasting peace. Omar Kablan, Straight Talk. And joining me now, Abdullahil Hassan, who is a professor of political science at Istanbul Shahir University. And joining us from London, Kashmiri novelist and journalist Mirza Wahid, who is the author of The Collaborator and the Book of Gold Leaves. Thank you both for joining me today. Uh, Mirza Wahid, I'll start with you there in London. This has been the deadliest year for Indian administered Kashmir. What is going on? It's been, as you said, it's been another bloody year. I'm in my mid-40s now, and the uprising, the mass movement, and the militant uprising, rebellion against Indian rule, started when I was a teenager. And since then, year after year, this is what we count. We count our dead, and uh, there's no way forward. This year has been particularly, particularly brutal. You know, I'm sure you're familiar with the word zulm. Uh, it describes everything that goes on in Kashmir. The oppression, the cruelty, the suppression, the denial of basic freedoms and basic rights, which results in a theater of war where, uh, as far as recently as Sunday, we had two teenage militants who, one of them was 14, who were killed in an encounter. Uh, at the same time, the armed forces, Indian armed forces stationed in Kashmir that keep Kashmir, that hold Kashmir for Delhi, they destroyed seven houses, residential houses, just like that, uh, which feeds into further sort of, you know, resentment and anger amongst the people. And it's not limited to militant groups. There's the, the militant groups were supported by people. Most often uh, in recent years, we've seen large, large crowds of Kashmiris uh, flock to encounter sites where their hair so and so militant is holed up in battle with Indian security forces, Indian armed forces. And uh, these civilians, they rush to these uh, encounter sites with no, no fear of death. This is what's mm -hmm. happened in Kashmir. And I think it's primarily because India and Pakistan haven't moved uh, closer to solving it. Uh, mm -hmm. So when I was a teenager, we had this massive, massive uprising, militant uprising. And now we are looking at a second, even third generation of militants. These okay. are young boys who have seen nothing, nothing but unspeakable cruelty and oppression. And that's what drives them to take up, the, uh, to, to take up guns against Indian mm -hmm. armed forces. Okay. I want to turn to my studio guest, and I don't think Abdullah it's going Hill, to end very soon. I don't think it's going to end. Right. Let me uh, ask of Abdullah Hill. Is the international community doing enough to end the political dispute in Kashmir? Well, Kashmir is one of those problems that United Nations has inherited from the very beginning, along with Palestine. So these are the two issues which involve, happen to involve Muslims. They have not been able to address, it, I mean, in a proper way, and therefore the problem continues. Mm -hmm. In the case of Kashmir, it was India, Indian diplomacy, that left the issue. I mean, Soviet Union, a number of times, cast veto. Otherwise, the problem would have been solved. Mm -hmm. This is continuing because of this kind of manipulation of the problem. Mm -hmm. And what the international community can do, they can do a lot. See, what has happened is that Pakistan was a partner from the very beginning of the dispute. Then, in 1971, Pakistan was defeated by India. And then, in 1973, there was a new pact in which India was able to force Pakistan mm -hmm. to declare the problem as a bilateral okay. issue. Because of that, it remained, I mean, out of the side of the national community. Right, right. But C then, certainly there is a long yeah, history to the right. conflict, but I want to ask Mirza, do you think that the, as a journalist yourself, do you think the international media is largely ignoring the issue of Kashmir? I, well, I wouldn't say they ignored it deliberately, but I do think that Kashmir has gone off the radar in the last few years. I mean, if you look at this year, it's been a brutal, brutal year. Over 500 people have been killed, and I'm sure not many people around the world know of it. Uh, as far, you know, uh, last month, there's a, an 18-month-old girl, 20-month-old girl, it's a baby girl, was shot with pellets in her eyes. 
And I read today, or yesterday, that she may not gain vision, regain vision in one of her eyes. What happens? What, what leads to such a situation? And if then people come out in the streets facing bullets, knowing very well they're going to be killed, shot at, uh, well, even massacred in the streets, or killed in their houses, or their houses burned down and destroyed. This is why people are so, so fed up with the Indian rule in Kashmir. 20-month-old girl, her name is Hiba Nisar. Uh, she's a baby, and I saw photographs of her with, with bandages on her eyes. I don't know what she did to deserve it. And if this, if mm -hmm. India is a democratic country, but in Kashmir it ceases to function as a democracy. It functions solely as an occupying power, whereby it uses brute force, anything within its arsenal, to suppress the militants, to suppress civilian protests, to suppress dissent. Uh, it's also become this cruel, tragic, absurd theater. You know, December 10th is a human rights day. In the heart of Srinagar, the local human rights body, the local human rights body called SHRC, State Human Rights Commission, it talked about drugs, drug abuse in the state, which is a serious issue, but did not mention the hundreds of killings this year, did not mention hundreds of kids who've been blinded, didn't mm -hmm. talk about the, what we call as disappeared people of Kashmir, about eight to 10,000 people uh, are disappeared in Kashmir. We don't know what, where, where they are. We don't know what happened to them. The Human Rights Commission in a place like Kashmir, it's headed by a you know, jobless, toothless judge, retired mm -hmm. judge, who chose to talk about drug abuse. This is where we are. Well, this is what the Indian state has done in Kashmir. You can't even talk about Human well, rights. Mirza, Mirza, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that, about the, about the UNHCR um, asking for a probe into abuses in to Kashmir. Why has India continued to deny access to UN rapporteurs and international rights organizations? Uh, because India feels India is a growing economic power, uh, major Western democracies, the Americans, the British, uh, they have in the recent past signed lucrative deals with the Indian state, so they are not going to talk about human rights when it comes to India. That's why the Indian state uh, felt emboldened to dismiss it summarily. And not just the okay. Indian state, it was shocking to see senior, senior uh, co uh, commentators in India who are otherwise progressive liberal people who bat for rights abusers across the country, they okay. wrote editorials dismissing okay. the first in-depth UN report into Kashmir as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as silly, as, as not having any merit. One of these editors, who who's also happens to be uh, the chair of the Editors Guild in India, he wrote an editorial saying that a report like this, which was the UNHRC, UNHRC report, is going to lead to further killings. I haven't come across a more uh, damaging or insulting, offensive uh, response to a serious, serious report into human rights abuses okay. in Kashmir. I'm going inter to interrupt you again because I want to get some that's comments the kind from of my, my, sorry, my guest, if I can my guest go on. here. For I'd like to get some comments from my guest here in the studio, Abdullah Hill. Do you agree with yeah. um, what Mirza was saying there about the economic interests with India? Do you think that the international community, the international media is looking the other way because India is such a rising economic force? Yeah, there is an element in that. But you see, our colleague mentioned about his teenage experience. It started in 1988 with a new so-called Intifada. And at that time, OIC took it again. OIC, the institution that represents all Muslims. Mm -hmm. And OIC adopted a number of resolutions that they will ask India to address the issue. But India has been importing work, I mean, India is sending workers to Arab countries, yet India was never asked to follow the OIC resolutions. These are the some problems. I mean, OIC has tried, mm -hmm. if you read book, he has mentioned yeah. that OIC has a group called Kashmir uh, Concerned Issue or something like that, and it meets every year, but it is useless because OIC countries do not care about what is happening in other parts of the world. Well, what about Turkey, though? What role does Turkey play in the region in yeah. terms of political support, and what role can Turkey play? Yeah, actually, this is a very good point. Problem with the issue is educating the people. 
I think this program, if you can educate people what is happening with the background information. And then my colleague has mentioned about Indian democracy. I mean, India is admired as one of the largest, the largest democracy in the world. But this is a very romantic idea. To my understanding, caste system and democracy do not go together. And this is what is happening. Indians do not believe that Kashmiris have right. They are human beings. And that has to be addressed. And it has to be taken to the international fora that Kashmiris are not being treated as human beings. So we have to educate people. Right. Okay, certainly. And I think Turkey can play a good role in that. Certainly a very, very challenging issue that goes back many, many years. Abdullah Hill Hassan and Mirza Wahid, thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. That's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Rachel Rubel. If you have any comments, do share them with us on Twitter with hashtag Straight Talk. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye. Thank you.